Hi everybody, it is time for our Family Friday program and we are here in our geology gallery here at the Museum of Northern Arizona. You will see behind me some volcanoes, you see here some volcano rocks, and you see a model of a volcano. We know that volcanoes explode outward, but did you know that some volcanoes and lava is underneath ground? We're gonna go to the lava tubes and check this cave out that was made long ago by moving lava. Let's go now and meet a friend of mine, and I want you to be listening for our special vocabulary words throughout our program. See you at the lava tubes. Hey everybody, here we are at the lava tubes, and like I promised, our friend, uh, Kent the geologist, he came out here to um, have some fun with us in the, in the rocks and in a, in a lava tube, how cool. So, Kent, tell us about this place. Okay, we're out here on a, on a broad plain where a lava flow erupted between 650 and 700,000 years ago. And as we look around in the forest, you can see nice blocks of it. It's a, it's a volcanic rock called basalt. And so this was an eruption of very hot, very fluid lava that spilled out from a great distance. We believe the vent, where it first came from, is about three miles in that direction, up near what is today Hart Prairie outside of Flagstaff. Kent, what is a vent? Uh, the vent is basically the top of the tube when the lava works its way up from deep within the earth. Okay. That's the geologists call that a vent. So if you see a nice volcano, the vent will be, you know, in the center of the thing. It's, there's usually a crater up on top of it. Uh, in some cases, we'll have fissures, long breaks in the earth break open, and the lava will come pouring out along the length of the fissure. Okay, so you see this funny thing on my head. It is going to be very, very important. It's going to be a light. So, can can you tell us if they do, if anybody wants to come out here, you really need to be prepared or you're going to have yeah, a horrible you, time. <laughs> you need to be prepared. You need good hiking boots or good stiff shoes because we're going to be scrambling down rocks here. That you need sharp, a jacket. Right? You wouldn't think so as hot as it is out here, but the cave is dramatically colder than it is on the surface. I always bring gloves uh, so I don't cut my hands up scrambling down the rocks. And critical is at least two light sources because you never know when your batteries are going to die. So I have, I can use my phone as a backup flashlight if I need to. These headlamps, if you use these for hiking, are great mm -hmm. for cave exploring. Because your hands are free. It keeps your hands free, exactly. Yeah, you don't yeah. drop your phone. Right, yeah. Because it is going to get so dark in there, you can't even see your hand yeah, in front you, of your if face. If you turn all your lights off, it is pitch black inside of these. Things. Measurements are very important in science. Right, Kent? Yeah, okay. always. Always. So we're going to do a measurement. We're going to find out the difference of temperature. So... So the temperature is 91 degrees outside right here now. And this also, my little gadget here tells me the humidity. It's 16% humidity. Oh, you can already feel the cold air coming from the opening of the, the cave. Yeah, they even recommend hard hats. Most people have hats. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We are at the opening of the lava tubes and you we can already feel the temperature difference, it is much, much cooler. This is where the roof collapsed on the lava tube. So you see this big pile of blocks, 
and this is all a collapse feature, and this is what allows us to get into the lava tube. If this hadn't collapsed, we wouldn't know the lava tube was here. Wow. It was discovered in uh, 1915 by a logging crew. And these stones have been, well, the basalt rocks have been stepped on so many times. There's some places where they're smooth. So that makes it a little difficult too. Yep. Oh, I can see my breath. We are coming down inside the lava tube and we've noticed that there's ice. So can't have, I mean, I don't see any water. What's, why is there ice? Well, there, there is water that leaks into the lava tube through okay. the cracks. Okay. Yeah, there's a drip. There yeah, a drip just went right in front of my face. Yep. Wow. And most caves have some water in them. All right, it is 36 degrees. Wow. And it has 67% humidity. Wow, much different from outside at the top. This is called a rock fall. Ooh, some, some terms in geology actually just make total sense. So only these pieces broke off of the ceiling. Uh -huh and fell down into the bottom of the lava tube. Another good reason to wear gloves is my hands are freezing. And this is where there was enough heat that it started to remelt the rock. So the rock had solidified to make the roof of the lava tube. And then there was enough heat added that it started to melt and it started to drip. So these are actually drips of liquid rock that would have been about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, if we were in here when the lava tube was active and you touched that, it would be 2,000 degrees. So there's been no rock fall here. So this is the original roof of the lava tube. Wow. Because, you know, if pieces break off, then you end up with these smooth surfaces. Okay. So anywhere you see this, you know you're looking at the original roof of the lava tube. So this whole thing, then this is the original width of this, you would have had a river of lava flowing through in this direction, going that way. And as the lava drained out, it left the roof exposed and there was an episode of heating. Uh, they think it might've been superheated gas or something. And it just melted the thin skin on the roof of the lava tube and it started to drip down and it made these lava sickles. Wow. And then the white comes later. The white is the result of rain turning into groundwater and soaking through the cracks. This right here is a cooling crack. So when, you know, you start out with this super hot liquid, it cools, it turns into solid rock, but then the rock continues to cool. And as it does, it shrinks. And it accommodates the shrinkage by cracking. And so you end up with these, you know, nice sort of uniform crack. And then the crack, of course, is a handy place for the water to seep through. Okay. When the rain falls on the soil. Up and the, that's why that covers. area is wet, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, that one's really, this one's really loose. Okay. The orange colors are oxidized iron. Okay. And so the water is probably leaching the iron right out of the salt. And it's reacting with oxygen in the air. Awesome. But again, you can see the crack up there when the water's come down yes. into the... Yes, that's a nice, yeah, that's a nice crack. This is um, much smoother, smoother. Yeah. yeah, easier to walk. Is that because 
I guess a lot of the wall didn't fall down well, here. Uh, yeah. yeah, very okay. little of the ceiling collapsed. Very little we're of the starting ceiling to get, collapsed. We're going to see where we're actually walking on the original lava surface a little bit further up. Oh, there. cool. See this bench right here? Yes. So at one point, the lava was at this level. Okay. And it stayed there long enough that the edge started to cool. And so it started to solidify moving out from the wall. And then the flow rate dropped. And the surface of the lava dropped down and it left this stranded here. And you commonly see these benches in, in lava tubes. When lava cools, it cools from the outside in. What looks like oh, the wow. last stage of lava flow coming through here. And How so can you, you can, tell that? Because it's a one big solidified mass. Okay. And you see these, these big slabs. Now those probably fell off the ceiling, these uh -huh. big flat pieces. Uh -huh. This part in here is all totally solid. See that? Yes, I do. Yeah. So, what so there was a bunch of rubbly material on the top of the lava flow, and then it ran out of gas, and it stopped and cooled right here. See this? Oh, wow. So that was the surface of the liquid. And so this was the last little bit of lava that came through. And then once that stuff solidified, then the eruption was over. So this was the very last day. And so this surface, again, you can see it's crumpled up a little bit. Uh-huh. And it gets, a, you know, it gets a skin on it, like, you know, when you boil milk or something. Okay, yeah. Because the surf the top will cool faster than the rest of the flow. Okay. And then, you know, if it continues to move a little bit, it'll crumple. Now, what volcano do we think made this? An ordinary cinder cone eruption is not going to produce a giant sheet of lava like this. Right. This is much more like uh, Kilauea in Hawaii produces okay. these kinds of things. Okay. And so the flow direction again is the lava flowed from there uh -huh. this way. It's going that way. And if you project that way and you go about two and a half miles from here, you get to roughly where Hart Prairie is right now. Ah, there are a whole bunch of volcanoes up there, but there's a shield volcano that's partially covered by a younger volcano. So this probably came from the, from the upper mantle on a pretty straight shot. And it was extremely hot and very, very fluid, and it was able to just pour out over the landscape. Wow. The fun thing to think about here, though, is there are probably dozens of these buried lava tubes. In this on this side of Flagstaff, but this is the only one we know about because it's the only one where the roof collapsed and gave us the opening. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. It seems very unlikely this was the only lava tube produced by that volcano. The original surface, and this is how old? Uh, Six hundred and fifty to seven hundred thousand years. Wow. I'm standing on something that old. That's incredible. Yeah. Ooh, look at this. This is cool. Let's look at that. That's the lava sickles. And then mm -hmm. there's, yeah. oh, wow, look at this. It looks like you can actually see how the lava was forming there. Yeah. God, that's incredible. Yes. Do you see all that? Yeah, so there's just little ripples in the sheet of. Uh huh. Boy. Wow, wasn't that fun? And thank you so much, Kent, for showing us or telling us all of the great information about the lava tube. So do you remember when Kent was talking about how the lava moved and sometimes it slowed down uh, and it moved through those tubes? And Kent was telling me that lava has the same kind of consistency as ketchup. So we are going to demonstrate the way 
lava moves. And you will be able to do this at home too. So we have a cookie sheet here. Um, make sure that it's nice and clean, that it doesn't have any leftover cookies or anything on it. It might affect the demonstration. So a nice clean cookie sheet. I am using the basalt rock because um, you want to have a little bit of a downward slope there. So something to lift up the part of the cookie sheet, okay? We're going to see it, which liquid is going to move quicker. Will it be the honey or will it be the ketchup? And then we're also going to demonstrate with different temperatures. Because remember when we were in the lava tube, uh, Mr. Kent talked a lot about um, the coolness. Sometimes it, the lava was cool, sometimes it was very hot. That's gonna affect the way that the lava moves. Are we ready? On your mark, get set, go. Oh, come on, honey. There we go. Oh, come on. Ooh. Well, I can tell you that the ketchup, which is representing our lava, is coming out much easier than this honey. I have to use much more force to ooze and squeeze out this honey than I do the lava. So, let's watch. It seems to me at the angle that I am at, they seem to be neck and neck, flowing at the same rate. And the ketchup seems to have lost some energy. It's kind of a glob. <laughs> And remember, um, Kent talked about there was times that the lava lost energy and it just kind of stopped and stayed there. Um, the honey seems to be winning this race a little bit. Who would have figured that? I was for sure thought the ketchup, the lava would have moved much quicker. Um... So let's see, obviously we can see that the honey is beating our ketchup that is symbolizing lava, right? You can see that the, the honey is winning. What happens if there's a shift in uh, our, our ground here, our cookie sheet is the ground, what happens if there is an uplift or a shift and it becomes a different angle? Look that that shifting gave our lava ketchup more energy to start moving a little bit more. It's kind of like the the rabbit and the turtle race. The uh, lava ketchup is going to get there in its own sweet time. Let's see what's gonna be what's gonna be the first liquid that hits the bottom or the other end of our cookie sheet. I'm gonna put my money on honey. Is it is the ketchup? Oh, I was just told that from another angle the ketchup's catching up. <laughs> And I can't see when it touches the bottom. <gasps> oh, the ketchup touched first. Did you see it? The ketchup did hit first. Wow. So what a difference a shift of the angle made with our liquids here. Now, I'm wondering, maybe you're wondering this too, Kent talked a lot about heating and cooling will change the movement of the lava. So let's see what happens if we heat up some of the honey and we cool some of the honey. So uh, you get your honey and with help because a microwave and 
liquid can get very hot. So get some help, open the lid or it will explode. Time to take the honey out and it it did 60 seconds did warm that up so now you have to be very careful this liquid this honey is very hot now so I'm going to close the top so it, it can't accidentally get out of me and burn me so if we're going to measure the movement of a liquid while it's hot we want to measure a liquid when it's cool. So I put some honey in the refrigerator a little bit ago. And okay, so we have our hot liquid here that we did for 60 seconds in the microwave. We have just regular, we just have regular honey here, room temperature. Um, then we have our cold. And this is a brilliant idea. If you put your honey in the freezer and then go make a cup full of ice and then uh, put your, your honey in there and surround the honey with ice, it'll keep it real cold because we want this to be very cold, okay? And this is pretty hot, okay? So we're going to Start with the whole the cold honey. I don't have three hands. Hopefully at home you'll have some help. So I'm going to give the cold honey a head start. So because I only have two hands. So I'm gonna squeeze. Oh, I when you guys do this at home, you will be able to feel how much pressure I have to squeeze to get this out. Now I have our room temperature honey and our hot honey and watch very closely. Whoa, I barely have to touch. I barely have to touch this one honey. Is The hot honey is just coming out. Our hot honey. <laughs> Our hot honey has already won the race. <laughs> and now remember, the room temperature honey was added onto our cookie sheet here later. And look, it is past our cold honey. Our cold honey is having a very hard time moving while it's cold. Maybe you have felt that sometime and you've been out in the cold it's kind of hard to get your energy level up in the cold. Just like our liquid honey finished the race differently, our rocks here are different. So both made of lava from a volcano, our basalt rock here cooled slowly and air bubbles formed in it. Our obsidian rock cooled very, very quickly. You can see the difference just like in our experiments today. Guys, once again, I've had such a great time with you and I've hoped you've learned a lot about lava and the interesting things about a volcano. See you next time.